Uh, welcome to APOE Canada's second live webinar in our series on evolving Indigenous workplace, defining a new normal. We're sharing a number of resources and information that help you navigate uh, through this ever-changing events around COVID-19. Uh, last week, we kind of picked up and, and really talked about some of the support programs that were available. But today, what we uh, want to do a kind of a deeper dive on is, uh, you know, the money that's flowing out to communities. How is it that, uh, that we're going to ensure that they're uh, tracked from an expenditure point of view? I wanted to give a shout out to uh, a bit to Helen Bobby Wash, who wrote a piece for us in the uh, management brief we sent out about uh, a month ago on this. And uh, certainly, uh, it, it became sort of top of mind when we were developing this, uh, this webinar series. So any questions that you have uh, during the presentation, uh, make notes or add them in the Q&A window. Uh, we have about 30 minutes. We're going through the presentation. At the end, we have, we have a 15 minute uh, question and answer session. At the end of the presentation, you could, you know, you could still, certainly uh, send a question in during it if you'd like, and I'm sure the presenters will uh, select them at, at that time. There will be some polling questions uh, and please uh, submit your answers uh, when we go through that. It makes it more interactive and as well provides us, um, you know, an opportunity to gather information. So today our presentation is COVID-19, tracking expenditures and reporting. And our pre presenters here are from uh, MNP and they're one of our long-standing corporate members at, uh, at AFA Canada. So I'd like to in introduce them. We have uh, Kenny Ansons. Uh, he's the uh, is MNP's provincial director of Indigenous Services in British Columbia and the Yukon region, and he's also the director of the East, working out of MNP's Vancouver office. Kenny delivers assurance, taxation, and business advisory services with a focus on First Nations and other Aboriginal business and organizations. With more than 30 years of experience in public and private practice. Kenny helps clients set strategic directions and realize their visions. As well as providing core accounting services, Kenny also participates in financial and co-management engagements and assists clients in economic development activities, including corporate restructuring, structuring and governance. Before joining MNP, Kenny worked with an international accounting firm and also contracted directly as a financial manager for several First Nations, giving them an in-depth understanding of indigenous issues and challenges. He takes pride in a role in his client's successes and his ability to deliver timely solutions to even the most challenging problems. Kenny was designated as a CPA in 1991 after receiving a Bachelor of Business Administration degree from Acadia University. And in 2001, he became a CAFM, Certified Aboriginal Financial Manager. We also have with us Tony Gill, MBA. He's a Senior Manager with m and Indigenous Services Group in Vancouver. For the past 27 years, Tony has worked in Indigenous communities on all aspects of First Nations programming, including finance, health, education, capital and infrastructure, o and social development, and emergency management. Tony has developed a strong working relationship with his clients in a number of capacity areas, including program funding and reporting, operational planning and support, financial management, governance advisory and policy development, strategic planning, management of infrastructure projects and economic development initiatives. Tony also has gained significant business development experience in a number of industries, including fisheries, forestry, mining, oil and gas, agriculture, retail, transportation, and arts and cultural enterprises. He possesses an MBA from the UBC Saunders School of Business in 1993. He also attained a CFM designation from AFA Canada in 2011. Tony supports his local community and school through volunteer coaching in various sports, including soccer, basketball, and ultimate frisbee. And he also is dedicated to local food security initiatives such as community farm harvests and assistance for the Greater Vancouver Food Bank and Quest Food Exchange. Our third presenter today is Lee St. Arnaud. Lee is a partner with Calgary's management consulting practice and has been serving MNP clients for more than eight years. He holds a Master's of Economics from the University of Alberta. Lee has a wide range of experience supporting clients in both the private and public sector. He helps clients streamline processes and leverage technology to make lasting improvements in their organization. Lee has been heavily involved in development of MNP's EASE program. The program focuses on delivering outsourced accounting and capacity enhancement programs for clients across Canada. 
He currently leads the implementation teams responsible for onboarding clients into the program. In addition to his work in MFPZ's program, Lee supports the technology advisory and performance improvement practices, working with a wide range of clients in the mid-market. Over the years, Lee has supported many public sector clients from provincial and municipal governments to post-secondary institution. His previous private sector experience spans a wild, wide range of industries, including forestry, real estate, and construction, energy, oil and gas, manufacturing, and retail. So I'd like to certainly thank uh, Kenny and Tony and Lee for uh, doing this today. And I'll turn this over to you, uh, Kenny. Go ahead. Great. Thank you, Terry. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Thanks for that great introduction. Uh, we're certainly always happy to assist wherever we can. Uh, and welcome to everybody. And as Terry said, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are in the country. Uh, I'm on the left coast or the west coast uh, on Vancouver Island today and uh, very happy to be with you. Uh, so my job, introductions, Terry's done a great job uh, making us sound great. Um, so I'm just going to go quickly through. Tony is going to talk to us about the reporting and Lee is going to get into some of the tracking things that we've been working on. Uh, all three of us work in the EASE program and, and as Terry said in my bio, I'm the director of that. We've, we've developed that over the years and uh, you know, we're working with several clients uh, across the country today. Practical recommendations for the management of COVID expenses. So we're just going to, you know, at a high level, we just want to touch on a few things today. As we know, you know, things are, uh, you know, unprecedented. We, early on, nobody knew what was going to, you know, what, what to expect. Um, but what we did know is we were working with clients on a day-to-day -day basis. And, you know, these are cloud-based clients and they knew that they were going to track expenditures. Some of them, even before the funding was announced, they knew they wanted to track. So we were able to assist them and set up the procedure around that. Timeline, you know, no one knows how long this will go on. Uh, you know, we're seeing some things loosen up depending on what part of the country you're in, whether you're Manitoba or Nova Scotia or here in BC, where they're starting to, as an example, take the plywood off the windows of the stores in Vancouver as of this week. So it, it depends, um, you know, what is each province going to do? Again, you, you'll know from your local authorities. We've got, you know, we're all glued to the TV. We get daily updates, who, you know, and your, your medical experts giving advice and uh, your premiers and, and the like. The response, you know, unprecedented, you know. Funding was initiated very early uh, and there, you know, continues to be almost daily updates and announcements. Uh, just talking to Terry before we get on here, there was an announcement today, uh, some more funding for, I think, pandemic planning. So details not announced, but there were some specific announcements there, and hopefully we'll get some more details on that uh, to come. Uh, I'm not seeing any slides, so I'm not sure what slide Lee is on. So, uh, you know, some of, this, some of this work here is, uh, you know, the emergency support services. If we're on that slide, Lee, uh, you know, when we started out early on in, in you know, thinking about what can we do, uh, what are clients going to be faced with? It was we brought to bear a lot of the or, you know experience that we had working on, you know in disasters, you know the floods and fires. It, it you know this is a pandemic that not, uh, you know unlike any we we've seen. Most of us were not around in the in the in the early 1900s uh, with the Spanish flu, but uh, certainly today it's it's again it's new to all of us. Um, uh, you know, the flyers and floods, we know what the process is. So we, we drew on that experience to, to pull out what's, what's going to be needed in the end. And, and some of those, you know, the, the work that we did with the communities, it was looking backwards. It was looking, you know, sometimes months, maybe years back and trying to recreate what happened, what was the money spent on trying to, you know, obtain the necessary documentation. So we, when we kind of put the process together was thinking about, okay, what's the end of mind? We know there's going to be some reporting required. So filing of claims or whatever was this of the such. So, so step one, again, you know, the money came out, you know, very fast. Um, and, you know, March, there's some funding in, you know, the last fiscal year, which you're going into audit season for 19 fiscal 1920, uh, the initial response and, and uh, then the, the community, support funding is coming out in the new funding agreements and you know again we know just from experience uh, you know terry mentioned that i've been around for 30 years and you know typically and i'm an auditor by training so we know there's going to be some reporting at, at, at the end of the day 
state. So it's uh, think about all that, and then as we walk through here, you know, we we had that in mind, knowing going into you know what our experiences is, and we just you know want to share that with everyone today. So for that, that I'll stop there, and I'm going to turn it over to uh, Tony now, and he's going to get into some of the reporting. Thank you. Great, thanks, Kenny. Um, hopefully, everybody can hear me okay. Uh, again, I'm from the BC office, so uh, I'd like to thank you all for taking your time in your afternoon to join us in our session here. Um, just maybe some housekeeping issues, and there's a, a Q and A uh, options and chat options if you have questions about this presentation. We'll certainly try and. Uh, address those uh, as we move forward during the presentation. Uh, if we can't uh, answer those questions or perhaps you have some confidential questions, I, we certainly have emails at the end of the slide deck that you can contact us later. So uh, we'd, uh, we'd uh, love to try and address your questions as they come forward. So um, our goal today is just to give some practical observations and tips uh, from our existing work with First Nations and Indigenous communities throughout the country. Uh, you know, as as fellow AFOA colleagues and clients in the Indigenous community, uh, everybody wants to know what's going on during this crisis. So, uh, you know, it's important to get your house in order organizationally so that you capture expenditures and then you're able to populate those into your reports. So uh, we hope that this exercise will provide you some cause for reflection and maybe some action towards the makeup of your response and recovery team, what resources you'll need, uh, how you're gonna deal with the uncertainty moving forwards. Because as Kenny alluded to, like right now, we are in a unprecedented times. Uh, there has just been a torrent of information and programming that's come forth over the past month. Uh, in our own internal math that we've done uh, through the firm, there's been over 300 different programs at the federal, provincial, and, and uh, uh, municipal levels. Um, this total, uh, we looked at April 30th numbers, uh, adds up to over $146 billion of funding. So uh, now not all of those programs are applicable to everybody, but you can imagine with the updates running as fast as they have been, uh, we're, we're trying to keep up with these websites as much as possible. So. Um, you know, with the notion of reporting and the importance that encompasses over the next year, the volume of funding alone that's been distributed, all level of governments are going to be looking to know how that was spent, how impactful that was in managing this COVID crisis. So uh, statistically, another uh, point of context is uh, in terms of the economic impact, uh, we're seeing that uh, as of February, Canada's lost 3 million jobs. Uh, our employment's fallen 15.6%. Uh, they're talking about uh, GDP hit. Uh, if the you know graduation of self-isolation uh, is started by you know the summer and moving onwards, our GDP hit for this year will be 12%. So uh, that includes a 500 billion dollar drop in the second quarter alone. So um, you know uh, all of this is just various ways to say it. it's massive. You know. Uh, through the uh, economic response benefit, we've had 7 million applicants uh, since February out of 19 million employable people. So 30, about 37% of the workforce, give or take, have applied for the CERB benefit, which is pretty staggering. So, uh, so anyways, uh, you know, there is a level of uncertainty. And, you know, what we're seeing right now is just the first phase of the emergency relief. It's to get us through the immediate not necessarily get us even into the medium or long term alone. Um, it hasn't even yet considered the recovery phase of the pandemic and what that's going to look like. So it's important to keep this in mind as we have this discussion, you know, and, and move this process along. So uh, lastly, there's been an us unprecedented response in terms of, you know, a global uh, response. G20 countries have donated uh, uh, 20 or five trillion dollars to the COVID response. So that's roughly like three times the equivalent to uh, Canada's GDP. So, uh, so this first slide here, uh, moving forwards uh, in terms of reporting format, I just wanted to start the section by touching on the importance of reporting as an integral function of the emergency management matrix. Um, for those of you that are actively involved in emergency response for fire and flood in your communities, you'll know that this framework guides the response uh, towards every type of emergency across uh, the country. So um, there are categories of responsibility here, uh, all of whom pro provide vital roles in respect to the incident command system. So at the top of the, uh, of the uh, 
the grid there, you see the command, which is the overall responsibility for coordination. They're in charge, essentially. Uh, red is operations. They're the tactical response. Uh, then you've got the planning, next steps, mapping, data analysis. They plan for the future. Logistics are the on-ground on help, uh, meeting the needs to get everything done and enabling everything at, at the site of the emergency. And then lastly, in the bottom right, there's finance and admin. They help recover costs, do analysis, uh, accounting, uh, maintain compliance with uh, regulatory guidelines. Essentially, someone has to pay and report on the uh, emergency and keep everybody on track. So, so the reporting function here, uh, even though it's not a normal sort of fire or flood scenario, it would fit within the finance and admin function in the bottom right. And it serves a real important function in not only financial tracking of the expenditures, but also analyzing the events uh, from the perspective of the, uh, of the applicant uh, so that all the data collected will help uh, learn lessons and deploy those lessons for the benefit of uh, more responsive planning for future events. Uh, so moving to the next slide from the emergency response time scale, uh, governments are still uh, trying to uh, introduce new programs and amend new programs. Uh, so right now there's a, a great deal of flux in what is going on uh, in terms of, uh, of funding uh, to the point where you're getting amendments every, every week. So uh, right now, uh, from a formal reporting standpoint, uh, there's not a lot of uh, set up for reporting yet. Um, our hope is that, uh, you know, with the significant fundings uh, of uh, uh, that's going to each community, that uh, they'll be using some existing frameworks for, for reporting, uh, that there'll be simple forms. Uh, given the fact that uh, the Indigenous Community Support Fund uh, currently flows through the EMAP uh, vehicle. Uh, we're expecting that uh, they'll be using the EMAP funding process for, for reporting compliance. So, um, you know, very, very important uh, to consider moving forward is, uh, you know, how you're going to populate those reports. And, you know, we're assuming that they're gonna be similar in, in, in framework to so many of the other reports that uh, communities fill out on a, on a yearly basis. So, um, uh, you know, so the challenges that we have right now, and, and you know, uh, maybe to give some context on this and on, you know, where we observe these challenges, you know, we've, we've had the ability to assist in a, a variety of different emergency situations over the years. Uh, with the firm, uh, you know, most notably with the uh, 2016 uh, Fort Mac fires and the 2019 High River fire. We've been involved in, in logistical aspects of, of emergency response for, for these communities and, you know, uh, supply of uh, critical, so, you know, uh, infrastructure, uh, hiring of uh, critical uh, staff to, to, able, to be able to manage the emergency, um, you know, uh, project coordination, staff augmentation, all things that we've been able to do in uh, over the last 10 years at least uh, from which we've gained significant experience. So, uh, you know, from these experience, we've observed some common themes uh, to be considered today. So uh, the first one, uh, most notably in our eyes, is the challenge we see with, uh, with staffing and with the responsibilities of managing the, the emergency response. Uh, quite often it's handled uh, uh, you know, uh, by people that are already in the uh, organization or in the community, uh, usually senior officials like band managers or, or finance officers. Uh, and, you know, uh, with the emergency funding comes usually admin slices that, uh, you know, we all know the, the perpetually underfunded uh, notion that band support funding gets in communities. Uh, so sometimes uh, communities see this as a way to augment their, their band support funding and just really just have somebody who's senior do this as a side of the desk exercise. So basically saying, you know, we know you're busy and we know you have a lot of responsibilities, but uh, this emergency management needs to be handled. So, you know, we think you should do it. So, um, you know, what that, what eventually happens with that is, you know, we all know how busy your senior staff are. And uh, sometimes this side of the desk exercise kind of gets actually pushed off the desk and you don't get the proper response to the emergency as, as you could. And, um, Sometimes things slip, uh, you know, capturing expenses, being able to populate reports, uh, having proper communication channels with all the different departments, uh, real critical tasks that sometimes uh, take a back seat just with the, the myriad of other uh, responsibilities that a senior official would have. Um, compounding that uh, is uh, 
uh, those communities that may be involved in concurrent emergency situations. You know, our thoughts go out to communities that have already started to deal with flooding in Alberta, uh, Fort Mac, uh, uh, Fort Vermilion, for example, and other areas throughout the country. They, you know, they're, they're going through flooding. We even know of communities in prior years that have dealt with flooding and forest fire at the same time. So uh, those put a real uh, uh, cramp on on your time as a as a person responsible for emergency management so given those uh, str constraints it's easy to lose control of those functions uh, and to have that in such a disjointed environment as as a COVID environment uh, you, again you you don't have the time to to uh, handle those tasks and you don't have the infrastructure set up to be able to communicate and coordinate um, you know when you have people working from home or you have people you know working in different offices you have limited communication capability um, perhaps you're not on the cloud uh, then the ability to coordinate those management activities between uh, admin staff and program heads becomes ever more difficult so uh, you know those those are some some certainly some challenges that we've seen in prior years with with communities under emergency management scenarios so uh, you know some of the lessons that we've learned um, for those uh, communities that are under evacuation or isolation, uh, we've certainly seen these days an advantage to having a cloud-based setup, you know, whether it's file storage, whether it's processing financially, um, those communities, uh, even right now under our, under our EASE program, uh, have uh, pretty much seamlessly transitioned over to normal operations. And you have staff who are either no longer in the office or half staff that are in the office, uh, they've been able to manage their their financial transactions, uh, you know, really uh, seamlessly. So, uh, you know, those those communities have had the most success in uh, moving forwards under under an emergency situation. Um, and where this comes into play is, uh, you know, when when you're trying to capture the expenditures in such a disjointed environment, and you miss a couple of expenses uh, as is apt to happen. Uh, at the end of the year, you're going to be doing your audit. Uh, and, you know, as we all know, ISC uh, will uh, action recovery is based on the lesser of your audited numbers or your program reports. So not having a complete inventory of your expenses really ends up hurting you in the end because it'll result in funding recoveries. And when that happens and, and ISC actions recoveries, then you're essentially, um, you know, you're sacrificing your future cash flow and your program management to pay for those recoveries. So, um, you know, at, at that point in time, it's, it's uh, you know, it's uh, an issue where communities wish that they had uh, had uh, more of a real time ability to capture those expenses. Um, Communities that have up-to-date accurate expenditures in the queue uh, are usually able to get the reporting in on time and that puts them uh, you know at the front of the queue for any next phase funding that's going to come forth as I said before this is really uh, you know seen as the as the response phase of the emergency uh, you know there, there could very well be recovery phase funding coming down the stream from from ISC or from you know your relevant health authorities or even pro you know your irrelevant provinces so uh, again this is important to, for, for everyone to know that uh, not only is it a chance to reduce recoveries but uh, it, it cues you up early for, for future funding so um, another important lesson that we've learned is really just about uh, about communication uh, constant communication between admin and the relative departments it's critical uh, not only in effective reporting but during emergency management scenarios so um, you know and that's uh, talking to, to to each of the different program heads, your departments, knowing what's going on, you know, on a on a daily or a biweekly basis, at least in the in the communities. Um, so, when you are in a situation where you're self isolated, uh, you know, uh, having an ability to continue the discussions gives managers the chance to to share what they've had and to discuss evolving priorities and you know what's what's important uh, you know sometimes uh, if you operate in, in silos as is apt to happen when you're not in constant communication you'll get uh, you know you'll get two different departments attempting to to initiate the same response efforts uh, so then, then you've got a double double expenditure uh, you know each department's not telling each other what they're doing uh, so in that regard you know uh, perhaps one set of those expenditures would be eligible under your response funding and uh, you know the other set wouldn't so 
in order to avoid that, I mean, you really want to make sure that uh, you're, you're, you're maintaining constant contact. Uh, and, you know, who knows how long this is going to last for you. We've got estimates of, of uh, the response uh, and, and the pandemic going for uh, close to two years. So, uh, you know, the need to be able to maintain uh, update meetings uh, should go certainly into the fall season and then the winter when you're going to have new realities come forth with your education programs what's going to happen with your school what's going to happen with post sec you know we're hearing post sec is going to be online for the next little while even in september uh you know what's going to happen if there's a, a spike in, in recurrence of cases uh you know do do we go back to self-isolation so uh, you know, uh, this is not, you know, uh, like a, a normal forest fire or flooding emergency where it's, you know, you're going to be in a in sort of a month of duration and then you, you go back to normal. This, you know, this could stretch out longer than we think. So uh, if your house is not in order and you don't have the ability to to record and to track those receipts and populate reports, then you're going to be further behind, you know, when, when it eventually comes time to submit. So, uh, you know, at this stage, in the absence of any definitive reporting guidelines that have been given by ISC, you know, across the board for, for, you know, for federal, provincial, municipal programs, you know, there's generally, you know, an imp important list of things that you need to consider in terms of information. So we've listed three of them here, you know. Obviously, have the cost item down, you know, have a receipt, a backup receipt or invoice. Uh, you know, describe what you've purchased or, you know, what, what service that you've, you've, you've hired to assist and uh, give a brief description on that item and the essential function that it has for the emergency planning. Because, you know, at some point you have to tie that, um, that expense uh, as an eligible expense and a justifiable expense in the, in the uh, whole uh, community support framework. Now there's lots of latitude, but at the same time, you want to ensure that that's eligible. So, uh, you know, those three things as a start, are critical to make sure that you're on top of the recording uh, uh, for the purposes of the reporting effort. So, uh, you know, moving from there, Lee has some, you know, certainly some some technical, tactical, technological expertise on on how to uh, how to deal with some of this reporting process. So, at this point, I'll I'll turn it over to Lee. Thanks, and uh, I know we've got a few minutes left here, so um, I I really just wanted to focus on some of the practical things that we can do to really help make sure uh, that, you know, future funds, if the if and when there are future available things around recovery, that, that those funds flow faster and more efficient, you know, decrease the time and effort associated with your recovery. Um, and really, at the end of the day, have a greater ability to recover higher percentages of disaster related expenditures. So I think the first one, and this, this is something that uh, we recommend that everybody does, is ensure that your financial system, uh, you know, whether, whether it's through your chart of accounts, a department, or a particular fund, that you've got that set up and that all of your uh, eligible or COVID-related expenditures are, are flowing through to that, to that GL. That'll make it a bit easier later on down the road when you're trying to, uh, trying to differentiate which, which, which expenditures you had were associated with COVID and which were for normal operations. Um, I think the, the second point is that ensure all employees um, who are incurring expenses that they're, that they're aware of the supporting documentation requirements. So as Tony mentioned earlier, we want to make sure that, uh, that you've got the supporting backup for any invoice that, uh, uh, that's COVID related and that that information is flowing into uh, finance in a timely manner. Thirdly, uh, if, even if you don't think that it's eligible today or the program requirements are a bit fuzzy, as we know there's lots, lots of new announcements and new programs coming out all the time, get, get that expense, get that supporting documentation into your COVID bucket. The, you can always take some things out of the bucket. It's gonna be a lot harder to go back and find the things that you miss later on if something does end up becoming eligible. Cap capture all supporting documentation. So invoices, pur purchase requisitions, you know, purchase orders, whatever you would have in terms of control at, uh, at your organization, those are gonna be really important um, uh, later on down the road. 
And I think normally the review cycle, uh, you wouldn't necessarily be doing it every week or every couple of weeks, but given the nature of how fast things are happening with COVID, it, it's probably a good idea to take a look and make sure for the stuff that's hitting your COVID bucket, if you've got a, a separate account or structure set up, you've got all that supporting documentation. So uh, later on down the road, when it's a month or six months down down the line, you're not trying to chase down those expenses or, or receipts. Um, I, We've seen in previous disasters, whether it's fires or floods, that it can be pretty tough to go back and find that you know extra receipt that gets lost along the way, and it and it ultimately reduced the size of of what was the eligible expense for the organization. Further, uh, some employee costs if we're are likely going to be eligible. Uh, so if if you have anybody that's incurring overtime or there's additional employee costs, you want to make sure that you're capturing the detail on your timesheets. A simple description of hey, you know, making sure that it says COVID on on the timesheet entry and that it's got the supporting documentation associated with it. Really, really helpful when it comes uh, later on down the line to uh, supporting any reporting requirements. Uh, and lastly, I think one thing that that may not be obvious, but with particularly with the fires that we uh, that we found last time was membership lists. So understanding who's where where off reserve funding is going. If you if you've got any folks that uh, that you're supporting through this that aren't necessarily living on reserve, that having that up to date membership list again can be can be particularly helpful when uh, if and when you know the the time to account for the expenditures does come through. So I know we're running short on time. So I've got about five minutes left, Terry. Is that all right if we uh, if we keep going? To, I know we're at the 11:30 mark here. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So uh, things that we've seen so far working with our clients and some of the challenges: um, adapting business processes to working remotely. So normally everybody's in the office, everybody can get together. You know, there's a physical flow of documents that happens. We've seen some of that physical flow break down. Uh, I'm not sure if that's applicable to folks here, but it certainly is a challenge uh, under the constraints we're facing today. Um, communicating with employees about business process changes, another challenge. So if, if you've had to change the way that you're working to work remotely or um, manage that physical distance, getting, that, getting everybody bought into the new process can, can be a bit challenging. Um, capacity shortage to manage additional workload. So either you're less efficient than you were when everybody was working together, you have to do more to get the same work done, or alternatively, you just have a bigger volume of work um, associated with managing the disruption, that there's, there's a capacity gap. And so you're asking people who are already busy to do more in a time of crisis. Uh, we're certainly seeing that across the board. Um, decreased efficiency due to physical distancing, um, disruption in business processes. So just even get, capturing the source documentation, having a way for people instead of walking it physically into the office um, and, and getting a signature, how are they going to do that digitally? Um, and then again, struggles preparing for the next onset of disruptions, whether that's fires or floods, if that's something that's applicable to you while we're still in the, you know, in the response and recovery of this current COVID-19 situation. So how to how to get through this. So one, one thing uh, that, uh, that we've seen some folks do, and it's certainly a recommendation, is consider securing additional accounting and finance support, um, helping to close that capacity gap early and staying on top of things. It's really gonna help you out later on down the road. If you're current, you're up to date, things are moving smoothly, you get a little bit extra help to get there. Um, it, it'll make the long run uh, effort easier. And based on our past experience, we think that if you do incur any costs associated with that extra effort, they should be recoverable. Um, another thing that we, we think can, can also help, particularly if you've been disrupted, uh, is to take a look at cloud applications to support um, business processes. So we, we use something called Receipt Bank, and it, effectively you can take a picture of, a, of an invoice on your phone and it flows through to finance with all the details and the supporting documentation. So you don't have to be hand in hand physically present. Um, T-Sheets, which is an Intuit product for a digital timesheet um, and Microsoft Teams to enable remote work and collaboration. 
I know that some folks definitely use have been adopting Zoom. Uh, we we really like Microsoft Teams because it it's got more than just the video share and conferencing. It it has uh, it has the ability to uh, share documents and things of that nature and work on projects together, even though you're not in the same place. And lastly, kind of continue to work with your funders, other agencies, and and your trusted advisors. Keeping everybody on the same page as you're working through this is really going to help. Uh, just a quick example. Uh, so if you have been disrupted and you, uh, you want to be able to take, to capture that, that expense or those items, we've got a, one of our team members here, you know, there's tools out there that exist today where you can take a picture of, of the expense, uh, the details flow through. And, uh, if you've got that, uh, if you've got that extra GL code or department or fund set up that's associated with these expenses, having those things flow through, that can, that can certainly help. Um, what, what MNP, what we're doing to help, uh, what we've seen, we've got a group of team members, T Tony and, and the gang, there's a, a large number of them that are continuing to research uh, support programs uh, with a focus for Indigenous governments. So if you do have questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. We're here to help you. Um, we're providing additional capacity. So if you're feeling that you need help or you, uh, or your team's under the gun or you're missing some team members because they need to self, uh, self isolate and can't work. Um, you know, we're, we're helping fill the gaps. We're helping people take, take their first steps on maybe a cloud journey. So, uh, applications that you don't need to be physically present to use. So you can, uh, use them to work remotely. Um, that's kind of both short term options and, and longer term as well. Uh, supporting finance departments move away from, uh, from paper checks to direct deposit EFTs. We've seen quite a bit of that movement here over the last little bit where this has been the push to get you there away from those paper checks. Um, and then, and then supporting people through business resilience, just how to, how to manage your continuity of operations while you're uh, experiencing a disruption. So we've got a number of supported applications that we use kind of across the board. Some, some of them will be very familiar to you and then others may be new. Um, again, if you, if you do have questions about how to, how to get to cloud or how to improve that workflow, or if you need some additional help, uh, we'd love to hear from you. So with that, um, why don't we shift over to questions? And uh, I think we're about seven minutes over time. So we've got a little bit of time left here uh, for those. I, I haven't been following the, the Q&A here last little bit, so uh, maybe we'll just jump in. Kenny, Kenny or, or uh, Tony? Um, I've been, yeah, I've been trying to do some of them, on, you know, answering them online as best I can on my phone. So uh, you yeah, the, the, see what's the, question, the questions I've been answering are about uh, eligible expenses. So people are asking, you know, things like um, whether security is covered, uh, you know, whether uh, office equipment, computers, laptops to be able to go remote are, are uh, eligible expenses. So, you know, uh, there has not been any specific guidelines, funding guidelines through the Community Support Fund at this point in time. Uh, as I said in my presentation, the support fund funding has gone through the EMAP vehicle. So, even as a loose, uh, you know, parameter, you could res you refer back to the emergency management assistant program guidelines. But uh, you know, suffice it to say that in all of its correspondence and all of their original webinars that they had uh, undertaken earlier on in the process, they're they've given. Indigenous communities maximum latitude in how they want to deploy the funding to best respond to their unique emergency situations. So if you need equipment to, to go off site, uh, that's something that they've said in the past that's eligible. Certainly we're seeing in many communities, they have security that are controlling the access and egress out of their uh, out of their communities. So, uh, you know, um, those are all understandably, you know, uh, valid expenses in an emergency response. So, uh, as I say, you know, uh, 
the best thing to do uh, when you're in doubt is just to track those expenses and then have that discussion earlier on with uh, with you know either your funding service officer or somebody at ISC through emergency services but uh, as I say going back to the discussions they have indicated maximum flexibility maximum latitude on how you deploy that funding Any other questions we have? It's the time to ask them. <clears throat> there are some other questions on here that you know we can we can uh, attempt to answer. Some of them might uh, require a bit more uh, cerebral thought process <laughs> before we answer, um, uh, but we'll we'll attempt to to get those back to uh, to participants. Yeah, and I, and I think from from my perspective. It's really about, you know, that you've got quite a bit of latitude. It's making sure that at the end of the day that everything that you do is well documented, supporting documentation, a description of what it was for, how it relates to COVID. Uh, and if you get all that stuff and you get it in the bucket, it's going to make the process a lot easier as you go through it. I think that's really the key message. Um, if, if there are future, this thing does go on for a couple of years and there are future tranches of funding, um, and it, there, there is a future requirement to, uh, to show how the money was spent. Those that take care of that up front, you're gonna, just going to be really well positioned um, for things down the road. Yeah. When you look, you know, when you look at things like the, the EMAP um, eligibility guidelines, you know, it's, uh, you know, it uh, covers the obvious ones, food security, it covers relocation, accommodation for people who have had to been evacuated or isolated. Uh, it deals with the temporary staffing requirements to bring people in to manage the crisis. Uh, you know, uh, all of the support mechanisms that, uh, you know, support you in an environment that you're not normally accustomed to in a community, those are expenses that are that are eligible under the EMAP program. So again, you know, by extension and by the fact that it's the vehicle for the community support funding, uh, many of those criteria will, would apply to the community support fund as well. I'll just uh, ask a question you guys just to uh, <clears throat> add to this. So. Um, so that's great to, about the uh, these expenditures and so forth of COVID and that kind of thing. So when we start uh, uh, coming back to work and that kind of like that kind of thing from our, uh, um, I guess from either working at home or, or doing sort of some sort of rotational basis, uh, do you believe that these expenses as well will be eligible because they they are related to COVID, right? Terry, are you referring to, to the the relocation back into a community, like the the uh, re the reset up costs and and the and the movement of equipment and and uh, isolation structures and the, and the like? Yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, because and, and you know it's sort of getting back to normal. Let's call it uh, the new normal. <laughs> And yes, understood. So again, not having seen any guidelines, I mean, it, you know, it, it's something that's not certainly uh, set in stone, but uh, as I say, the, the communities have had, uh, you know, uh, indicated to them that they've got the flexibility to, to utilize those funding uh, as they see fit, uh, you know, whether that be for this tranche of funding for the response process or if there's a if there's a version two or a phase two of that funding that that comes out over the next uh, fiscal year in terms of a, a recovery process you know how do you rebuild your communities those that have been affected by covid uh you know it certainly would uh you know uh off the top of my head it would seem like it would fit in in either one of those waves of funding so yes i mean you can't you can't necessarily go through the response process set up isolation structures you know set up all the the infrastructure to deal with the covid response and then once the covid response is over you kind of walk away from everything so i think you know the the expenses associated with getting back to normal would would certainly fit as an eligible, eligible expense 
I just would like to add to that too for a second. It just when you think of the expenses, if it's you know if you think it's eligible, track it. And the other thing is, you know, in BC, we know that the, the health authority and emergency measures and ISC all overlap. So if it may not fit under, we use the term buckets, uh, uh, but it may be eligible under the health authority as an example. So the, the, the message is, again, to track it and make sure you have the receipts for it. And if it doesn't fit under one, one pot of funding, it, it more than likely will come into another. And, you know, they're, they're working closely together in all provinces. And, uh, you know, I've heard directly from the health authority here in BC that, yes, they, they have different funding for different things. So it's, it's important to know what, what's applicable in each province and territory as you go forward. But uh, just wanted to throw that part in. Okay, I think we, uh, we, we have time for one more uh, question, then we'll wrap up. Uh, uh, I can't see the list of questions there, but uh, I don't know if you guys can from uh, MNP. I see Marion Brass Yellowfly has a question. I can't see that. I'll, I'll just say it. What, what, okay. she's, what she's asking is uh, tangible capital assets and should this process be done separately or what's the guideline? So tangible capital assets and should this process be done separately or what's the guideline? I think that's a Kenny question. <laughs> well, I, I think some of the, there's, there's funding out there for emergency shelters and the like, um, which ultimately would be a tangible capital asset. Um, Again, that that's probably one that takes more more cerebral uh, work, as Terry or Tony mentioned. But uh, we can certainly take that one offline and discuss it, get a little more parameters around it. I mean, certainly TCA from an audit perspective would follow the same, you know, PSAP guidelines. Um, but uh, I think yeah, we can certainly take that one offline to get a get a better answer out there. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you uh, very much. Thanks for the, uh, I'd like to thank MNP for doing this uh, webinar. They're one of our longstanding uh, corporate members. So appreciate it, uh, Kenny, uh, Ansoms, Lee, St. Arnaud, and, and uh, Anthony Gill. Thank you very much for your presentation. So, uh, you know, what we've been doing here is, um, you know, we took a look at sort of the benefit programs and then sort of the expenditure side here. You know, certainly uh, I think one, one of the things that uh, MNP is kind of alluding to here is, how important uh, the use of technology and finance and financial management is going to be going forward, right? This is something, uh, you know, that as we, we come out of this, that that's for sure that we've got to do as a group uh, uh, going forward. So next week, we're going to uh, shift gears. Next Thursday will be at 2 o'clock uh, Eastern and not 1 o'clock. Uh, we're going to shift gears a, a bit and start talking a little bit about our human resource management uh, responsibilities. So... You know, as you know, we're, uh, we're all kind of be, uh, somewhat going to be starting to think about uh, returning to the workplace. So what we need to do is, uh, you know, have a, have a webinar on this uh, called Returning to the Workplace uh, from a Healthy Health and uh, Safety Point of View. You know, uh, the reintroduction to the office life can, you know, it can be quite dangerous and mishandled. And because, uh, you know, as we know, we don't have a, we don't have a, a vaccine yet. Um, but I think as your organization starts to think about this return to work, for your employees, uh, you know, the, the webinar that we're going to be presented uh, next week by uh, Arila Management uh, will we'll outline some of the main concerns here that you should be considering in a safe work uh, environment for your staff. So next week, we will uh, reassemble next Thursday at 2 o'clock on our, our webinar and really talk about this uh, returning to, the, to work. So we'll do a, an HR sort of webinar next week. So. I want to uh, thank everybody for uh, for taking the time out to, to view this webinar. Thank you again, MNP, and thank you to Staff Apeway Canada to uh, for all your good work. Uh, appreciate it. So bye now, and we'll uh, see you next week.